There we go. Greg just pointed out to me that I'm using the word apostolic. That's not the word I'm trying to use. Thank you, Greg. Sometimes in the evening, my mind doesn't work very well. Apocalyptic. That's our word. <laughs> you guys have already figured that out by now. But apocalyptic is the word that we're really looking at. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about this, uh, this concept. So here is the Vines Dictionary. Um, Vines Bible Dictionary of the Word. And, and so it basically gives us an understanding of an uncovering or an unveiling, um, a revelation, an appearing. And in fact, it's translated the appearing in 1 Peter 1 verse 7. So that, that's, that's a basic definition of this word. It simply means to uncover something. Um, it's the, to suddenly see the true nature of something or someone that you previously couldn't see before. And so it's something is being uncovered, it's being revealed to you uh, for the very first time. And, and I think that because of our life experiences, you know, growing up in different, different families, different environments, that we have a tendency to see things just differently. Um, we have a different outlook on, on life. And I was thinking about, uh, about and the king, you know, if a king looks at something like food, and you were to ask that king, where does your food come from? What do you think he's going to say? He's probably going to say, well, it comes from the, the kitchen, right? He comes from the cook. And so you go to the kitchen and you go ask the cook, well, where does the food come from? And he says, well, it comes from the, from the market. And you, you go to the supermarket and you ask the owner of the supermarket, Where's my, where does your food come from? And he says, well, it comes from the farmer. You go to the farmer and guess what he's going to say? Where does, where does your food come from? The soil, the ground, it's, he grows it, right? But every person in, in that chain has a much different perspective about where the food actually comes from. And, and so it would be really interesting, wouldn't it, for the, for the king to go to the farm <laughs> and see where the food comes from? Because then he would have a, an eye-opening experience. It would be a, a revelation to him, an uncovering, if he didn't already know, where his food actually comes from. So that's a basic idea uh, of the word and its normal use. Usage. Now, in the Bible, the, the word apocalypse or apocalypsis, it, it is the uncovering of something by, by God. God is uncovering something. And, and it's generally something of a heavenly nature. And it's usually, in most cases, something that is um, bad in the Old Testament primarily. Now, that doesn't mean that that word always means that, and we'll talk about that, but a lot of times when we see these visions or these uncoverings, God is revealing to man that, you know, I see you, <laughs> but I don't see you see yourself. Does that make sense? You know, because man tends to have a, a skewed view of self, and, and so God uncovers what he really sees. And, and so that's the idea. The basic biblical understanding is to show humanity what is really going on from a heavenly perspective, uh, to show humanity what's really going on from a heavenly perspective, to pull back the curtain, if you will. Now, the book of Isaiah is a really good one. Um, there's my definition there for you guys to look at first, just a second, because it's going away. Isaiah chapter 1. So Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah is a great book. When you go through the book and you're reading all of these things that Isaiah saw, and in just at the very beginning of the book, it tells us that this is the vision of Isaiah, uh, the son of Amos, and, and now look at the rest of it. This is really important. It's a vision, we know that. It's a vision that's being given to Isaiah by God. But look who it's concerning. It's concerning Judah and Jerusalem. That, that very beginning of this book helps us to understand what's going on, who, who is doing the uncovering, who is receiving the message, who is it about... Um, all of this is really important for our context for the rest of the book. And it says that he saw uh, during the reign of Uzziah uh, and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. And, and so we, we know that these, these kings are involved. So we're going to be thinking about these kings. We're going to be thinking about these, these two places, divided nations here, Judah and uh, Jerusalem. We're going to be thinking about these things as we read the rest of the book, right? And we're going to be asking ourselves the question, what is being revealed about these places and these people? 
What does God see that we don't see? Or what is God communicating to his prophet that he wants to go tell the people that they seem to be having a hard time seeing? Um, they seem to be having a hard time viewing what God sees. So Isaiah will have a vision uh, in the text as you move through the book, and it'll be a vision of God's throne room, basically. It's the temple of God, right? And when we think about temple, we've talked about this before, but when you think about temple, we need to think about a place where God's dwelling is, His presence is, remember? And so Israel had a temple. They, they were commanded, God's people were commanded to build a temple, and God said that He would you know, come down and His presence would be in that place. And so it's a temple or a tabernacle is a place where God's presence is, where man can draw near to God in his presence. And really, when you go all the way back to the very beginning of time, that was what the Garden of Eden was, wasn't it? It was a place where heaven and earth came together, and God's presence and man's presence were in harmony together in one place. It's like a temple. That's really what the garden was. And so what Isaiah sees is this, this vision of being in the presence of God. Now, what happens usually when you're in the presence of God if, if you're unclean or impure? What, what happens? Is it a good situation or a bad situation? It's a bad situation, right? I mean, we, we think about God and we want to be close to Him, but if you're in an unclean, impure state, to be in God's presence is dangerous. Remember, we use the analogy of the sun, right? The sun is good. It's a good thing. We need the sun, but we need to keep our distance from the sun, right? Because if you get too close to the sun, what's going to happen? Without some kind of protection, which there's not really anything that you could possibly protect yourself when going into the sun, but if there were, you're, you're a goner. And so it's the same with, with God's presence. God's presence is holy. So if you look at... Um, oh, somehow I missed that slide. No, oh, that's correct. That's good. We're in the right place. So look at uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Just ignore the, um, the top part of that. It says Isaiah 1. It's, I, it's actually Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 7. And it says, In the year of King Isaiah's death, uh, Isaiah says that I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. So we can kind of, we can see it, right? I mean, in our mind's eye, we can get a, a view of what this looks like. That's what this is designed for. Uh, it says that seraphim stood above, above him. Now, seraphim was kind of a half-animal, half-humanoid type thing with wings. It's the only angelic being that really had wings. Angels don't have wings uh, in the Bible except for these seraphim. And that's the idea is there's this winged type of angelic being uh, that uh, he sees. And they would generally guard the entranceway into the, into the garden or they would guard having been embroidered on the curtains of the Holy of Holies uh, to kind of give this depiction. They guarded God's most holy places. That's what they did. And so that's what he sees in his vision. He sees these seraphim, and they stood above him, each having six wings. Uh, with two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, uh, and with two, he flew. So it's a pretty awkward situation he's got going there. But the idea is that we see it. You know, we can kind of in a weird way, paint this image, but he saw this. This was his vision. This is a very strange vision. Uh, it reminds us of this holy of holies that, that God had established for his people, this, this holy place that uh, God had uh, where his presence was. It was a heavenly perspective. Uh, and so from this heavenly perspective, we, we begin to see some earthly situations pop up. And that's the idea that... that we have with this word, um, apocalypse, it brings to mind earthly situations. But it's using heavenly imagery, so it's God's perspective of earthly situations. Um, the apocalypse could bring hope. I mean, it could bring hope for Isaiah. In a lot of time, cases, it was very hopeful, for him anyway, because he knew from these visions that God's people would have a future. That's really the message that that book ends with. God's people will have a future. Um, that God's, God's not going to leave them to their, their own destruction. Now, the bad news is that this also reveals, sometimes this language reveals something 
catastrophic, right? Something's going to happen. People are going to be in the wake of God's wrath. And so that is being revealed as well. But not always. Not always. So we don't want to lump it all into one big you know, pot and say, well, it's all catastrophic, because it's not. So this type of language can reveal something very good. But what it also does is, because of the good news and the bad news, it's supposed to change the mind and the heart of the hearer. So the person who is seeing and hearing, and as in this case it would be Isaiah, and as he goes and he preaches this to the people, it's supposed to be changing hearts. People are supposed to be changing. Once they see things the way God sees them, they should change the way they see themselves. And that's, that's really the focus of a lot of, this, uh, a lot of this language. And like we said before, that king who goes to the farm, he might have a much greater appreciation for his cook, right, in the supermarket once he realizes where his food comes from. And so God wants us to see these things. He wants us to hear these things. He wants us to understand these things from his perspective. And he wants us to change in light of that revelation. So let's look at some New Testament examples. This is Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. This is the, uh, Paul's account here in verse 15. He says, But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased... To reveal, apocalypto, to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. See how that, that works? God is revealing something. Something is being uncovered. And Paul is the recipient, but he has a responsibility to go and tell, tell others about what he has seen. To preach him preach Jesus to the Gentiles. And he said, I did not immediately uh, consult with flesh and blood. So the idea there is just that some were saying that Paul was getting his message from man, and he was just repeating what he heard. And Paul says, no, no, no. I saw it. <laughs> I, was, I was there. I was a recipient of, of this vision. Remember Paul's uh, experience in Acts chapter 9 on the road of Damascus? Remember that? where all of a sudden he comes into contact with the risen Jesus, and, and he's blinded, and they hear the voice, and he, it's, a, it's a great story, isn't it? But he was a persecutor of the church, wasn't he? I mean, he was breathing murderous threats against the church. He was dragging Christians out of their home because they believed that this man Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, that's, that's who Paul was until he had a revelation. That's what he's saying right here. Until God revealed to him this Jesus, until Jesus becomes evident in his mind. Now, he had to be made blind. And the irony is he has to be made blind so that he can what? See. And that's, that's the story. So he, that's the idea. He has a, an apocalypse right there <laughs> on the road to Damascus, an uncovering. Something happens to him, and that's the event. Now, that obviously is not the end of the world, is it? Uh, you know, Paul probably thought it was there for a little bit, but I mean, it's not. It's, it's God uncovering something. That's the root of this word, the root meaning of this word uh, apocalypse. So let's look at another one. These are the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. These are so great. It says, At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of, of heaven and earth, that you have hidden. Um, crypto is that word. It's, it's the idea. It's just the opposite of the word we're looking at. So it's the idea of God's, God's covering something. Something is, something is hidden. Uh, something's being covered. Things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed. Apocalypto. <laughs> you, you've hidden them, but now they're being uncovered. They're being revealed uh, to certain people. You revealed them to infants. And then he says in verse 26, he says, Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except for the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal. Same word, apocalypto. So Jesus, what is he doing? He's, he's going around, and he's preaching, and he's, he's revealing and uncovering God for the people. It, it's, it's really the heart of Jesus' ministry, 
We know that he went to preach the kingdom, and that's obviously a, a major point of Jesus' preaching, but his whole existence, his being, his being on earth is a revelation. He coming in the flesh is a revelation, and he's revealing God to the whole world, this unknown God that people can't see, they can't touch, they, they can't really draw near to, suddenly see Jesus. And they draw near Jesus, and they follow Jesus. And Jesus is revealing the God of heaven to the people, and that's an apocalypse. It's an uncovering. Um, obviously a good thing, right? I mean, that's, that's a wonderful thing, but that's what Jesus is, is teaching there in that message. Look at this one. This one's great. Ephesians chapter 3. This is Paul talking about his ministry again. And he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the, of the Gentiles... If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation, apocalypsis, there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. So, same thing he said before, but he's just he's saying it again in this Ephesian letter, and he's basically telling the people that his mission is to go to preach to the Gentiles, um, but to preach a message or information that was revealed to him, and that's, that's that word that we're looking for, that apocalypsis. It's being uncovered to him and by God, and he's going to go and he's going to preach it or teach it to others. Um, that's the idea. So verse 4, he says, By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So what does Paul do with his apocalypse? What does he do with his, this thing that has been revealed to him? He doesn't just go out and preach it, but he does something else to it or with it. What does he do? It says, by referring to this when you read, you can understand my insight. So if you're reading it, what does that mean Paul did to it or did with it? He wrote it down, right? I mean, so not only did he go out and preach it, but he's writing it down so it can be preserved uh, for us to read as well. The insight into the mystery of Christ. He's taking what he's been given and he's sharing it with others. We do the same thing when we preach Jesus. Verse 5, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men. Remember, that's the same thing Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 11. There's some things that were hidden that have now been revealed um, to the sons of men as it has been known or it has been revealed. Apocalypto. It's been uncovered to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. All right. Verse 6. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the, the gospel. Euangelion, the good news. And so it's just beautiful, isn't it? Because this all involves us. This is us, the Gentiles. Here we are on the other side of this, you know, thousands of years on this side of the cross, and we are recipients of this wonderful promise that was given to a, to a man so many years ago that that through him came a family of, of people, Hebrews, Jews. And, and through those Jews comes a man who is by nature the revelation, the apocalypto of God, the uncovering of God. And, and now, through the apostles who are receiving visions and information through the Spirit of God, are now writing down and going and preaching the great message that they have received uh, through, through all of this process. So it's a beautiful imagery that we really need to, um, to grasp on to. All right, move to verse 7. He says, "...which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of His power, to me the very least of the saints." Um, this grace was given, "...to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ." And to bring to light. Now that's another aspect of apocalyptic language. It brings something to light. Something that was once hidden or in the dark suddenly becomes illuminated. So this language is very fitting for what Paul is saying here. To bring the light what is the administration of a mystery of which ages have been hidden. Uh, the word hidden is uh, apocrypto. It's the same basic word that Jesus used in Matthew 11. The idea that something had been once hidden or covered but is now being revealed. It's, it's like somebody just pulls the sheet off of it and says, here it is, right? And it's interesting because the prophets would speak of these things, but they would speak of them as shadows, Peter would say. They're kind of kind of dim. The light's dim. I mean, it's there, and they get an image, and they get an idea of what's happening, but they can't really see it fully 
until Jesus finally comes and the apostles go out and preach it. And suddenly it's like somebody just rips off the sheet and says, here it is, the good news. The, here's Jesus. Here, here's the message. Here's God's plan. Here's what God is doing in the world um, right now in the church. This is what God is, is doing. And he says, in God who created all things. Verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. So that's, that's another thing. Bring to light something to make something that once was not known, known. Basically a revelation through the church, to the rulers, the authorities, and the heavenly places. So, apocalyptic language was a, a literary style of ancient Hebrews. They used it a lot um, in just normal writings, not just biblical writings. Um, the, it was used quite frequently, in fact, to the point where they were very familiar with this style of writing. A lot of their stuff was obviously kind of fictional, but they, all, they wrote in, in poetic form. Uh, they wrote with a lot of imagination. They wrote with um, things and messages that were packed with symbolism. And they were really just trying to teach something to other people. Now remember, the difference between that and what we're reading in the Bible is that God is the one doing the uncovering, right? That's the big difference. And so God is uncovering something, and he's using this similar type of language um, to, to tell us something. Something hidden. Something that wasn't known before. And all of a sudden, wow, there it is. <laughs> I mean, it's just full force. And we are left with this great responsibility to, to receive it, to understand it, to study it, to learn its meaning, and to grow from, from that experience. One of the, the great apocalyptic pieces of literature in our Bible is, is the book of Daniel. Not all of it is apocalyptic, but there's large chunks of it that are. And so Daniel has, um, has these visions, and also the king has visions in this book. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had some visions in Daniel chapter 2. And so in Daniel chapter 2, it says in verse 19, when the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Remember that? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was, was troubled because of a dream. He didn't know what the dream meant. He didn't know what it was all about. Uh, he has a dream of this great statue. Then he has another dream of a tree. And, and uh, nobody could understand the dream. And he tells his people that, that I'm not going to tell you what the dream is, remember? Uh, but you're going to tell me what the dream is. And then if you're right, then you can tell me the interpretation. If you're wrong, then you're, you're going to die. That was, you know, the ultimatum. It wasn't really a good deal for anybody. And so nobody could tell him what the dream was. Uh, finally, Daniel comes forward, and, and he is going to reveal uh, this vision to him. Uh, but he doesn't do it on his own power. In other words, Daniel doesn't just go in there and say, okay, well, let me, let me make something up, and then let me just put some, put some things together, right? I mean, he didn't just make stuff up. But he says that God will reveal to me your dream and reveal the interpretation of that dream. That only God can do that. You know, Daniel recognizes that. So the mystery was revealed to Daniel in night vision, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. If you skip down to verse 27, it said, um, Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired... Neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, diviners are able to declare this message to the king. They already knew that, right? I mean, that's not a big secret. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, these guys have already tried. They've already tried to trick the king. They've tried to persuade the king. They've argued with the king. That didn't work. Uh, the king was already ready to kill everybody. Um, so that, that didn't work. So he's already telling them what they already know. Man cannot reveal this. That's, that's the idea. That needs to be ingrained in our hearts and our mind. When we're looking at this type of literature, and we're looking at the Bible apocalypses, we need to recognize that we cannot, by our own power, just look at the text and say, well, that obviously means this. Or, it looks like, it. surely this... No, we have to rely on the text. We have to dig into the text and learn its meaning from the text. In verse 28, however, there is a God. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in latter days. Uh, and this was your dream and the vision of your mind while you're on your bed. So one thing we have to get straight right away, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit in just a moment. This particular vision is evidently something that's going to be in the future, right? How do we know that? How do we know that this, this vision, this interpretation was a future of a future event? Does the text tell us? 
It does, doesn't it? it that's how we know. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't know. So an apocalypse is not necessarily a future event. It can be a past event that's being uncovered. It can be a present event, event that's being uncovered. Or it could be a future event that's being uncovered. Now, when we think about that word, we're always thinking about what? In times, right? That's always where we go. In times or way over there, sometime in the future. But that's not the way that language works. Not in the Bible anyway. It's just our English language tends to work that way. So the biblical word doesn't work that way. In this case, it, however, it, it does. But look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. This is a great, great chapter. This is where Daniel has this incredible vision, remember, of this, this great turbulent sea. Now, in the Bible, we know from Genesis 1 and, and following and, and from Genesis 6 and 7 that, that water often represents something turbulent, chaotic, Something not so good. God uses water as a form of judgment on the wicked human family. That water plays a role. And so when we're reading through the Bible, and you're just reading through it, and you get to Daniel, and you're thinking of water, and you're thinking of sea, you're not thinking of calm and, and peaceful. You're thinking of choppy and chaotic and destructive. And that, that's the imagery that we tend to see. And so Daniel's going to see this vision, and there's going to be these large beasts. We'll talk about them here in just a minute, uh, starting in verse 1. He says, At the first year of uh, Belshazzar, king of Babylon, remember Nebuchadnezzar is, is no more, Daniel saw a dream and vision. So we already know what we're talking about here. In his mind as he lay in his bed, and then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary. So this sounds very familiar to what we're, we read about with Paul, right? Ephesians chapter 3. Has a vision, he receives something, something is being uncovered, and he writes it down uh, for others to be able to see. Verse 2, Daniel said, I was, I was looking at my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up uh, the great sea, the chaotic seas, the turbulent seas. I mean, there's, there's nothing good about that. I mean, you, you know, you get in a boat and you get out in the middle of the water and, and um, you know, you don't have a, a sail or you don't have an anchor and the, the sea becomes choppy. I mean, how do you feel? What's, what's, your, what's your intentions? What's your feelings at that moment? Are you comfortable? I mean, if you're Jesus sleeping in the boat, you probably are. But I mean, you know, most of us are very uncomfortable with this, right? Nobody wants to be out in the sea when it's like this. Nobody wants to be caught in the midst of it. That's the kind of imagery we're seeing. And these four beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion that had the wings of an eagle and kept looking until the wings were plucked. And it was uh, lifted up from the ground and it made, made to stand up on two feet uh, like a man. And a human mind also was given to it. And then he says in verse 5, And behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear, and it was raised up uh, on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise and devour much meat. So these are pretty intense. I mean, these visions are always very intense. And then in verse 6, After this I kept looking, and behold, uh, another one like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. Uh, the beast also had four heads, uh, and dominion was given to it. Verse 7. After this, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had, a large, had a large iron teeth. Um, it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all of the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So, can you picture that in your mind? I mean, you know, just, just kind of think about what Daniel saw. This is intense. You know, Daniel's vision is intense. I mean, if anybody had had that, you know, we would be thinking, what's wrong with me? You know, I mean, this is, this is intense. And so Daniel sees these things, and he says, while I was uh, contemplating the horns, I don't know if I would have been thinking about the horns, but it, it's evident that Daniel is accustomed to this kind of vision. I mean, you know, you see all this stuff, and he's thinking about the meaning of these horns. Behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three, uh, three first horns were pulled out of the roots before it. And behold, this horn uh, it possessed eyes, like the eyes of a man, and mouth uttering uh, great boasts. All right, so let's just stop there for just a minute. Let me ask a question. Is this literal? 
Is this, is this something that's happening in real time? Is there a real bear with, with real ribs in its mouth? Is there a real beast with ten horns? Is there a little horn with eyes and a mouth? I mean, is this, is this something that is really real-time happening? Is Daniel expecting this in real time? Like when he's done with his vision and he's walking down the street, is he going to see this? What do you think? No, of course not. It's, it's not the idea. The idea is that these things are symbolic. They mean something. Now, without any context or any other reading, tell me what they mean. Anybody have any ideas? No context. Don't use the rest of the book. Don't use the Bible. Just use this text right here. What does this mean? We don't know, right? That's the point, isn't it? We, we don't know what this means. We don't know until we keep reading and we learn more about, about this vision and, and the images that are, are here. Getting ahead of myself. If you go down to verse 15, it says, As for me, uh, Daniel, uh, my spirit was distressed. Now, before this, he had the heavenly vision. He saw God on his throne. He saw other thrones. He saw this son of man figure who comes out and he tames the beast and destroys them. And, and it's really an intense scene. Uh, and Daniel's very curious about what all this means because he doesn't know either. And he says, Daniel, my spirit was distressed with me and the vision in my mind kept uh, alarming me. And he says, I approached one of those who were standing by. So, I mean, just think about this, right? I mean, you've got this, this vision and he looks over and there's somebody else there. You know, it's so crazy. And so he goes over there and he inquires of this other person who's standing there, whomever it is. And he says, what does this all mean? You know, what, what are we talking about here? What's the exact meaning of all of this? Uh, so he told me. And it, he made known to me the interpretation of these things. I mean, that's the way this works, right? Uh, Daniel was just as confused as everybody else. He doesn't know what this means until somebody tells him what this is. What is this uncovering? What is this apocalypse? What is this, what is this event? What's going on here? And so it's going to be told to him. It's going to be revealed to him. What, what it means. And he says, the, and it says, verse 17, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. And then he says, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. So now what do we know? What, what are the beasts? What are these images? What are they? Kings. Kingdoms. Right? And in Daniel chapter 2, that's the same idea, right? The, the images of the statue are also kingdoms, great kingdoms. And they're the same, if, if you want to go back and compare them, I and this is basically the idea. So we really have no business looking at the text and saying, well, I think that this image means this nation, and that image means... Well, no, we, we, we have to stick in the Bible, right? We have to see what the Bible says about these things. Now, with that said... What do you think about, when you think about a, a, a great beast, is this something comforting to you? Is that, is that good? I mean, if you've got a great beast coming through your land, is that a good thing? It's not a good thing. It's destructive, right? It's chaotic. It's bad. And so what God is revealing is that these nations that he's talking about are not good. They're destructive. They're going to kill. They're going to destroy. They need to be taken care of. They need to be dealt with. Somebody is going to have to deal with them. The good news from this message is that there are some people. <laughs> There's going to be some people, uh, the, the person says, that they're going to be the saints of the highest one, and they're going to receive a, a kingdom. Obviously, it's not going to be like these other kingdoms, right? It's not depicted as a beast. And this kingdom is one that they're going to possess, and it's going to be a forever kingdom. Now, the other kingdoms are beasts. They're monsters. Right? They've come out of the chaotic waters. They're destructive. They're trying to destroy everything and its path. Now, let me ask you this. We have some ideas through history what biblically these, these nations were. Right? Is it possible that the application of that, a kingdom, a nation, a country, being a beast, oppressive, and destructive. Does that image by itself have a message that's timeless? It does, doesn't it? I mean, we've seen it before. We've seen nations rise up that are not good, right? They're not serving God's purpose. 
There are nations, there have been nations throughout time, there have been people throughout time who have been given power and, and risen up to great power and they were ugly and destructive and they hated people and destroyed people and destroyed lives and we've seen it before, haven't we? The message is timeless and it's going to keep happening over and over again, forever and ever until Jesus returns and the forever kingdom comes and all of that's going to be dealt with. All the evil, oppressive nations of the world will be dealt with. Now, that's the overarching message. Now, for Daniel, what he is seeing is that there will be throughout history, throughout Jewish history, up to Jesus in, in the church in the first century, specific nations that are going to rise up and be destructive. So, my point is this. It's not that we're looking at these, this language to look for some kind of um, a, a time code of the mysteries of the age. We're not looking at these, these letters and these writings as a way to try to figure out, you know, well, when, when, when's the end coming? When's Jesus coming back? And what's going to happen? And all this. But there's a timeless message in all of this. The message is that God knows, right? He knows. He knows it all. But he also knows that those who are being oppressed and the oppressor are not the same. Those who are being oppressed and the oppressor are not the same. That there are nations out there they are going to be very hurtful and very ugly and very beast-like, right? And God knows that, doesn't he? But then there are going to be faithful people that belong to him right in the middle of it all. And they're, they're going to suffer, and they're going to have hardships, and they're going to be consumed by the beast. But the end of that message, of course, is that God knows, and his people will have victory through the Son. It's, that's the big picture, right? I mean, we, we see that as we move along. So look at Revelation. We're, we're going to look just at the first few chapters here, and uh, or first uh, part of the first chapter, rather just really quickly, with all of these thoughts in mind. So that was Daniel. That was Daniel's vision. Um, obviously, it's going to be, it was a future vision, so Daniel wasn't expecting it to happen tomorrow, or it's something that was going to happen over time. Daniel understood that. Um, it's not our business to try to reinterpret those. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, it, it simply starts off with apocalypsis. That's how it starts. <laughs> this is an apocalypsis. This is an uncovering. This whole letter is an uncovering um, this book is a giant apocalypse. And it's the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ, or the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his bondservants the things which must soon come to pass. Now, what's the difference between what Daniel received and what John's receiving, time-wise? Think about that. When Daniel received his message, God said that these things are going to be for latter days, right? Future future stuff. But whenever John's receiving his message here, his apocalypsis, the uncovering that John is seeing, it says that these things must soon take place. So what does that tell us about the letter? Does it tell us that we should be looking for future latter-day events? Or do we need to be focused on, on the context of the letter? The context of the letter, right? Well, who this letter was written to uh, is, is, is the, are the ones who will be the recipients of a lot of these things. And he says, and he sent and commissioned it by his angel uh, to his bondservant John. Now, angel's messenger, that's what that means. Um, the, a person can be an angel um, in biblical language because it simply means messenger. Now, there are angels sent by God. There are angels in other forms, but that, that's neither here nor there. The point is it's a, it's a messenger. And then in verse 2, it says, Who testifies to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So John sees these things. That's really important that he's seeing these things. And then blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. Uh, for the time is what? What does it say? Does it say the time is far off somewhere in the future and you don't have to worry about this, John? Is that what he's saying? He says, no, the time is near. So if John's writing this, and, and this is in the mind of the readers, what do you think they're going to think about? They're going to be like, well, that's okay. This doesn't apply to me. Something in the future. I don't really care. Or are they going to be really focused on the here and now? I mean, if you receive this letter, what would you think? 
You're going to be paying attention right now. What's going on? And that's where we need to be. The context is immediate. The things that are happening. Look at verse 4. He says, uh, John in the seven churches um, that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Who are the recipients of this letter? He says it right there, right? In verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. We already know that this is great information, guys. I mean, this, this is information that's very helpful for us to understand the letter uh, because we're, we're not guessing. We're not kind of making stuff up. We, we are given the information we're looking for. We want to know where did this message come from, right? We, we want to know when is, when is it applicable, and we want to know to whom received it or who received it. Right? And we want to know who's initially writing it down. So we've got all that information uh, that we need. So we know that, right? We, we know all of that, and we're able to um, draw from it uh, the context of the book. Now, if you didn't know anything else about the apocalypse, the revelation, would you know enough at this point to understand the basic tenets of the book? I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff in there. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's pretty intense, right? I mean, it's, it's wild. But you already know enough to know that this is a biblical book, right? Rooted in, in the past, things that were taking place in their lifetime. But it has a message that's timeless. And that's what we want to draw from it. What's the timeless message of the thing being uncovered? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend the next um, 34 weeks. I know it seems like a long time, but it's really going to go fast because we're going to break up the book into eight major sections, and we're going to dig into it and, and learn the message that it has uh, for us. But I want you to think about this. This is the main thing that I want you to get from, from this lesson this evening. A biblical apocalypse is when God reveals something. He uncovers something. To show humanity what is really going on from a heavenly perspective. To pull back the curtain. A heavenly perspective of an earthly situation. And that is what the book of Revelation is all about. So I hope that that was helpful. I hope that that would gives you a little bit more comfort as we got to move into this very unusual book. Um, but I look forward to the study and I look forward to the, the lesson that it will teach us. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, as we, as we dig into this, this book that you have left for us, that you have preserved for us, Father, help us to, to not try to insert our own worldview Help us not to try to take our understanding of words and circumstances and, and insert them into the text, but to learn, Father, what you, your Son, revealed to the churches in that day. And help us, Father, through that, that message of victory and peace, that you will bring us into a state of understanding that will help us to live our life in the present being victorious and having peace, knowing, Father, that you are in control and that you have all things under you, Father, and that through you and through your Son, we will be more than conquerors. Father, be with us as we study through this book and be with us as we go throughout this week. Help these messages to comfort and, and give us strength. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen.